Yeah, thank you very much and uh, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, members of the media. Uh, I just wanted to uh, maybe to shed highlight uh, on what happened yesterday in a closed session uh, of the heads of state chaired by the president uh, of Chad uh, on financing the African Union. And then after that, you can ask any questions you want uh, so that you can have an interactive uh, discussion. Uh, yesterday, the main item that has been that was there was really uh, the mandate of the African Union, which is growing, and the mandate that has been given by the heads of state of the member countries of the African Union Commission. The issue that has been on the table for quite some time now has been the sustainable funding uh, of the African Union activities, the normal operations, the programs. Uh, the peace uh, operations, uh, how do we finance it sustainably as member countries? Uh, there has been many models that has been uh, discussed in the past, but this time the heads of state were determined to make sure that we find a final solution to this so that there are no more uh, discussions. The normal way of financing the African Union Commission activities has been a formula that has been used on assessed contributions. Assessed contributions, of course, taking into consideration uh, the key principles, like solidarity, uh, equitable payment, the capacity to pay, and ensuring that no single country is left behind. And they use a proportion, an indexed GDP uh, kind of formula that brings in how much each country is supposed to contribute. The main issue has been uh, basically defaulting and sometimes delay to disperse the amount of money. And this has really been affecting the functioning uh, of the African Union. Secondly, uh, it has, as a result, of course, we realize that most of the money, a big chunk, was being uh, financed by the uh, donors themselves, 76%. And because of that, we needed to find a solution. So there has been previous efforts uh, that, has been, uh, uh, that has been proposed, especially by uh, uh, former President Obasanjo, the former president of Nigeria, where he was proposing uh, a two dollars uh, on hospitality, meaning that if you stayed in a hotel, they should deduct two dollars out of per night uh, out of what you pay. There was also a proposal on $10 per ticket. Anytime you want to travel and you purchase a ticket, they should add uh, $10. And then there has been so many other proposals by the different ministers on how this also can be done. But at the same time, <clears throat> last year, the heads of state uh, of the African Union took a bold decision, and they gave instructions. They took decisions that Africans, the member countries, should finance 100% of the operational activities of the African Union Commission. Number two, they should finance 75% of the programs of the African Union Commission. And number three, they should also finance the uh, 25% of the uh, peace support operations on the African continent. These are the decisions and directives that the heads of state took last year. Now we are trying to find a solution on how this can be achieved. The African Union Commission then hired uh, Dr. Uh, Donald Kaberuka, who used to head the Africa Development Bank, and his team to find a formula on how to make sure that we can sustainably fund uh, this African Union Commission against this directive. So what happened yesterday was trying to find a simple formula that can work, and a formula that is predictable, that answers the uh, calls of the heads of state, and making sure that it is uh, uniform to all the African member countries. There is the formula that has worked in many uh, other uh, organizations, uh, they use the formula of the 0.2% of the 
of the illegible uh, uh, levy on imports. Here, all of us have the imports, all the countries, the import, and we have what they call illegible goods that are coming to our own countries. So the formula that was proposed by Dr. Kaberuka was to charge 0.2 percent of the illegible uh, imports. In other words, it's a levy that is equivalent to 0.2 percent. This one is simple. It has worked uh, in the uh, West African uh, community uh, states. It has worked in the Central African states uh, within their own economic uh, uh, operations. And it is a formula that can work in every country. So uh, this one here, when uh, was put actually in the model, we found that actually, uh, according normally for this year and for last year, the budget that was voted for the African Union Commission was 447 million US dollars. And then you can add the peace operations, which ranges depending on the conflicts. But this, man, this uh, formula would generate about 1.2 billion US dollars meaning that actually it can generate even more money uh, than we are currently generating. It will be predictable. It will be very easy. It will be corrected by the revenue authorities of each of our countries. And then opening an account of the African Union Commission in a central bank so that the central bank could be the one actually dispersing the money. Part of this money goes to the peace operations, of which also the heads of state said that for each region, at least making sure that it has 65 million US dollars for each region, specifically meant for peace operations. So 65 now comes to about uh, 300 and, and about 20 million dollars that is meant for the peace operations. So this really helps now achieve the 25 percent for the peace support operations. It helps achieve 100 percent support on the activities of the African Union Commission, and also it helps achieve 75 percent funding for the African Union Commission programs. So this is a decision that was adopted by the heads of state after a long uh, uh, cross-door discussion by the heads of states themselves. So we are glad that this issue now is resolved, and it is going to be implemented starting from 2017. So I think that's all I can say for now, but it's open to uh, any questions. Thank you, Minister. We'll start uh, with the gentleman here. Uh, thank you very much, sir. My name is Colin Smoy. I write for the New Times Daily. Um, earlier you said that the major problem was defaulting and, and, and delayed payments. So beyond the formula and beyond the, 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 ambitious, prop, uh, the ambitious targets of $1.2 billion, dollars every year uh, did you put up any any mechanisms to avoid default and and delayed payments or fines or, or, or something thank you yeah maybe i can answer one by one yes, sir. thank you very much uh what we did is that this is not the money that's going to be managed by the treasury for any country that has a treasury there are many demands on the treasury and they want to make sure that this one is blocked the money is collected by the revenue authorities. The money goes to an escrow account in the central bank with clear directives on how this money is going to be dispersed. So then it is automatically dispersed, and meaning that actually there wouldn't be any issue because it's not combined with the normal uh, budget resources of other uh, activities in government. So this will be automatic. And at the same time, maybe if I can add on this, uh, the heads of state also agreed on a proper accountability mechanism and the follow up of the ministers of finance to make sure that the money is efficiently used. Thank you. We'll take the second question. The gentleman near you, sir. Um, Minister Nicholas Long uh, for Voice of America. Sorry, I can't hear. Can... Nicholas Long, Voice of America. Sorry. Nicholas Long, Voice of America. Um, you said that the formula can generate 1.2 billion uh, and that this will help 
to meet the 25% uh, for peace operations. So, can you have um, another microphone? I can't hear him properly. Can... Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Um, you said the uh, bill, uh, 1.2 billion, and this will help to achieve the target of 25% uh, for peace operations, 100% for operating costs, etc. Um, have you any? Uh, have you, can you estimate how far it, you will go, or how far this um, formula will go in meeting that shortfall? Uh, to or whether will it achieve 25%, 100%, and 75%, uh, uh, or will it come some way towards that? I don't think I understood because initially 76% of the financing was coming from the donors. We want to take the ownership. And that's why the heads of state of the African Union Commission, I mean of the African Union, took a decision last year that they needed to finance 100% of their own core activities. We needed to finance 75% of the programs. And at least we needed to contribute 25% on peace support operations. That was a decision that was taken. And that's the beginning. Because we are supposed to be financing 100% of our own activities in all aspects. And because of this decision, you had to find a formula on how we can achieve this. And the formula is what I just presented. And this is just the beginning. This means that we are no longer, the donor community will no longer be paying 76% of the whole financing. No will be financing 100% of activities, 75% of the programs, and at least 25% of the peace support operations. Thank you. We'll have uh, one from here. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, my name is Edmund Kaji. I work for Nation Media Group. Honorable Minister, skeptics um, are wondering if some of the African countries cannot finance their own budgets, they still depend on donors, how committed will they be to this initiative to fund the EU? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, in our own normal budgets, we, are we have been supported by the donor community because of the resources, the rich resources that we have. Each country in Africa is doing everything they can to make sure that the donor dependence is reduced until it is eliminated. The same thing with the African Union. They have been financing 76%, and that's not good. And that's why the heads of state has taken decisions on how we can finance ourselves. That's what the heads of states are changing. And that's why there was this formula that is binding to all African member countries that is going to remove what has been uh, uh, really uh, um, happening where we are depending uh, on the donor for financing of activities. And that's why we are changing it now. The heads of states have taken a decision that this one must change. Thank you. We'll have the next question here. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Groom, CCTV. My question is in relation with the illicit financial flows. We've been hearing reports that about $80 billion per year uh, is going out of the continent and we, we cannot locate it. Did you see that as a source of financing whatever projects the continent has or even the peace funding? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the sources of financing are quite many. Number one, we need to boost our own domestic resource mobilization within the taxation so that we can tax more efficiently to increase our resources. This is what is most sustainable. Then number two, uh, we also need to make sure that we have accountability mechanism that avoids this money from leaving our own continent, meaning that everybody pays taxes that you are supposed to pay as per the law. This one uh, is also being done. But also we are trying to make sure that we, con con we uh, um, put in place a conducive environment so that investors can come and invest in our own continent. We are also putting in place a mechanism whereby we develop the capital markets so that the private sector money can also participate in development of our continent through the capital market and the products that we put on the market. We are doing practical things. And at the same time, once this works, 
then the private sector will be leading in terms of financing. They will be paying the proper taxes. There will be accountability mechanism that will be in place. And all this helps in terms of generating the necessary resources where we don't have to depend on the donors for continuous support of our budgets. Thank you. We have uh, the gentleman there. Merci. Mon nom c'est Baïk Louali. Je suis journaliste au quotidien national Le Sort du Mali. Ma question c'est de savoir un peu. Vous venez de, de nous donner des mécanismes de financement, des nouveaux mécanismes de financement de l'Union africaine. Je voudrais savoir un peu quelle était l'ancienne méthode de financement. Ensuite, savoir est-ce que ce nouveau mode de financement va concerner le programme de, du NEPAD ou bien il sera seulement question du financement des actions de l'Union africaine. Est-ce que le NEPAD est concerné par ce nouveau, les programmes de NEPAD sont concernés par ce nouveau mode de financement Merci. Uh, can someone, I don't want, I don't capture everything. Sure. Uh, my French is not up to his level. But, uh, uh, the first question was, uh, uh, what was the old financing mechanism for uh, the African Union? And the second question is, will also this new mechan uh, financing mechanism also cover projects like NEPAD? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the old mechanism was a formula that is indexed according to how much you generate in terms of the, your GDP. Not all the countries are the same level in terms of the GDP. They have a formula, the African Union Commission, which they do, and that's why they call it assessed contribution. That will remain because there has to be fairness so that there is also equitable uh, contribution. That one will remain. What will change is the source of money. Initially, it was coming from our budgets. Now we have introduced a formula of 0.2% of eligible imports, and that's where the money will come from of financing the activities. But also the financing, or the, the money that will be disbursed, will also be in accordance to assessed contribution. So that way then the fairness, the equitable uh, distribution is actually also captured in that process. But also what we are doing is that concerning the NEPAD, they are the normal programs of each of the countries and regions. It is not the African Union Commission that is going to finance the projects, for example, uh, that are in East African community. The projects that we share with Tanzania, with Burundi, with Uganda, with Kenya, with, uh, you know, they are not, they, there is no way the African Union Commission is coming to finance those projects even if they are NEPAD related. What that means is that actually the region itself will be financing these kind of programs. But there will be other programs that are, that are continental in nature. And that's the, those are the projects that they'll be involved in. But the ones that are regional, that's why you have the regional economic communities, also with resources to make sure that they can finance the regional projects. So this is very clear uh, on which projects they have been financing at the continental level, but also the regions have to chip in whether it is uh, ECOWAS, whether it is ECAS in Central Africa, Economic Community for Central African States, whether it is SADC, whether it is COMESA, and the East African Community, and so forth. Thank you. Um, there is a lady here, I'll ask. Lady. Thank you very much. It's Anna Montero from Bloomberg News. Minister, please could you define an eligible import for us? Yeah, um, the eligible imports uh, in many countries, there are some products which are, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, intermediary goods, things like fertilizers, things like medicine. There are some products which are intermediate in nature and also which are sensitive uh, for the uh, certain baby food products and others which are very, very critical, those ones uh, definitely are removed from the base of the imports. You are importing them, but also they have other big implications. And those are the ones that you remove, and then you say eligible. The rest are eligible, uh, basically imports. Yeah. Thank you, Hassan. The gentleman there. Okay, thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Abdul Karim from Anadolu News Agency, based in Addis Ababa. My question to how much uh, this formula will be succeeded in Africa with a very complicated situation, uh, conflict in South Sudan and the terrorism in Somalia and the Sahel. 
how much will be succeeded this work formula? Well, the formula, whether the country is at war or the country has issues, the revenue authorities will keep working. And among the money they collect is the money that comes through the customs on imports. And that's why this money is collected. It is sent to the central bank. The central bank never stops working. So the money is, dis uh, is dispersed anyway, regardless of the situation on our continent. Thank you. The lady, yeah? Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So, uh, Sun Lan. Can you speak on the microphone? Uh, okay. Yes, yeah. I can hear you now. So, um, two questions. Number one, how would a completely 100% completely self reliant um, African Union change or reshape AU's relationship with traditional donors and perhaps new partners? And second, we all know that this year um, the summit's main target is to choose a new chairperson for the AUC. And then uh, I do have seen some of the candidates do hold this view that, uh, um, uh, I quote, it will always rely on funding from its members. And suppose, I mean, candidates with, with this view got elected, how do you um, see the implementation of the new mechanism going on forward? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe number one, uh, for your first question, uh, I don't know whether you think that uh, continuous reliance on donor funding is the best way. And that's why I want to relieve the donors of the burden so that we can finance ourselves. And that means that actually the relationship between the African Union Commission and other countries would actually also continue to depend on other uh, uh, on, on, on the interests of both parties, on trade, on investment, on uh, um, diplomacy, on other areas where we can support each other. But this time, we should not be a burden to the uh, donor communities. We should be able to finance our own activities. And this is really a very good beginning. Now, before this one is implemented, which is 2017, that was a decision that this decision will be implemented in 2017. What has been happening, the formula, the disbursement uh, way or that, has been that has been used in the past will continue until 2017. Now, with regard to the election of the new management, the chair of the Union Commission, the deputy, and other commissioners, that one I cannot comment. It's in the hands of the heads of state. And once that is done, then it will be communicated to you. Thank you. We'll have a question from Sandra. Thank you very much. My name is Sandra Idosu. I publish a magazine that aims at raising awareness about service delivery and excellent service. My question is to find out with the new ways of uh, financing the AU. Did you discuss new ways of probably... Uh, for instance, we know that uh, at such meetings th there are very good um, decisions that are taken, but implementing them usually uh, there are issues around them. So my question is, if a country does not finance, if a country does not pay as it has to pay, do you have new rules uh, that would enforce or that would oblige that country to pay no matter the, 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 the issues they, they probably have? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for your magazine. We've been reading it, and it has added value to the way that we do provide our services. Thank you. Um, for, the, uh, for the new rules, if you want, the new formula, uh, what we are saying is that this, first of all, it is simple. It's automatic. It's not bogged down by any uh, budgetary pressures. But at the same time, if something happens, the enforcement mechanism at the African Union Commission by the heads of state also remain that you are punished if something goes wrong, going contrary to what the heads of state have adapted. Besides, they all adapted this mechanism, meaning that actually if you don't do it, you have violated what all the heads of state have adapted. 
So the enforcement mechanism remains. It hasn't gone anywhere. So that's why uh, we are saying that we are very, very confident that this one is going to work. Next question, Tabaro. Yes, my name is Tabaro. I work for Kigai today. My question is about uh, the peacekeeping operations. Uh, how much is Africa spending on peacekeeping a year? And uh, only 25%, you said, is coming from outside. Who's the biggest financier? Thank you. Um, number one, I would say that uh, the peace support operations, which has the, uh, maybe the three components, uh, which has the capacity building, it has the preventive diplomacy, and it has the normal uh, activities, that uh, the normal operational activities. This has been mainly financed by the donors. It has been financed mainly by the donors, uh, almost the tune of 98%. And that's why we want to make sure that we raise our own contribution to 25%. Uh, the UN definitely is involved, and other donors who are members of the uh, United Nations that are contributing uh, to this. But it depends on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, whether it is the European Union, whether it is the U.S., whether it is others that are contributing. They contribute through the UN system, and it helps in terms of financing uh, the peace operations. Thank you. We'll have uh, the lady here. Thank you. I'm Asma Suhaili from the Daily Sudanese Akhbar al newspaper. Uh, my question is that uh, some countries are uh, suffering uh, economical sanctions like Sudan. Uh, have you uh, put regard for uh, improving, uh, improving its uh, contribution to these uh, sanctions? Sorry, I, I, I didn't get your question. Can someone maybe elaborate on this? I think she talked about countries like Sudan that uh, are under economic sanctions. Mm -hmm. If there is a special consideration for those countries, is that right? Yes. Okay. Have you put, uh, put any regarding for this so as to improve its contributions in the uh, uh, financial system of the AU? Uh, there, there, there are two things that we should separate. There are international sanctions by whoever. And then there is the African Union. African Union has its members. Sudan is one of the members of the African Union. And that's why the president is here. Now, once you are a member, you are bound by the rules of the membership. It has nothing to do with other sanctions. Because each country, you collect taxes, you run your economy, and you are a member. So you're obliged to contribute. It has nothing to do with anybody else telling us what to contribute. It's Africans, it's only member countries that are deciding what to contribute. And this decision is taken with Sudan being a member. So it has nothing completely to do with sanctions. Minister, with your permission, can take three more questions? Sure, okay. no problem. Uh, we'll have uh, one from the back, then uh, from that side as well, and the one on the front. So Hassan, if you can start with the gentleman. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. My name is Moses Walgembe from NBS TV in Uganda. Uh, my question is uh, uh, just how much money did uh, African Union contribute, the member states contribute last year, and what are you anticipating from all those taxes to contribute this, uh, this next term? And then secondly, you're talking about the issue of international donors uh, wanting to move out of uh, the partner states and so on. What kind of duration is African Union giving itself to be able to move away from dependence on international donors? Thank you. Uh, I think I'm, I'm just repeating myself. I had said the donor community were contributing 76% of the budget because of the issues that we had. And I said last year, the heads of state says, we have to change this. And they say we must finance the activities 100%. We must finance the projects by 75%. We must contribute to peace operations by 25%. That was the decision that was taken last year. And now the issue, how do we finance it? 
this time in this meeting, a decision has been taken that we take that we use the formula of 0.2 percent of eligible imports that supplied uniformly by all the countries, the money collected by revenue authorities, dispersed by the central banks. That's a formula to make sure that we can actually leave the burden out of the loaners that have been helping us in terms of financing. And this will start next year. And next year, according to our calculations, it generates 1.2 billion. A meaning that actually is going to achieve that objective next year once the, the formula applies and everybody corrects according to our calculations. So this one is going to help in terms of solving the issue that we had. Thank you. And the lady from... We'll have uh, one here then in front. The gentleman there, the, uh, on that side. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Yaniste Kamanzi, working for Umseke. My question is about the recent uh, report of the Overseas Development Institute. Uh, it's a UK institution saying that Sub-Saharan Africa is facing uh, what, what is called a credit crunch. Uh, is that uh, a shared situation in Sub-Saharan Africa? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I haven't read that report of ODI, but the credit crunch starts from this country here. We are part of the Sub-Saharan Africa. I don't know by any means if we are facing a credit crunch. And I don't know what the credit crunch means, because we are still financing our budgets. <clears throat> we are still growing. Our last quarter GDP growth was 7.3%. Our rating is B+. Plus. Our debt levels are 34%. We are financially sustainable. Our inflation is below 5%. I don't know what you would call the credit crunch. Honestly, uh, you have to go country by country, and I don't think that would be really the right way of facing the credit crunch. Maybe what has been happening is the issues that are global in nature, that are shocks that are affecting almost everyone. From the last year when there was a slowdown in uh, uh, China's uh, growth that affected all our exports, especially the commodity exports in minerals, and also in addition to the prolonged uh, low growth by the European Union due to the debt crisis that has been taking place uh, uh, in Europe, especially Greece, and at the same time, the actions that have been taken by the, uh, the central bank in the United States of raising the interest rates, which has an impact in terms of the uh, depreciation of exchange rates of many currencies, but at the same time uh, of making sure that uh, our capital markets, uh, the cost of borrowing money becomes very high because of those kind of actions. These are shocks that are affecting everyone. They are not selective only for the sub-Saharan Africa. They are affecting everyone in different ways, depending on whether you are commodity exporting uh, or also uh, whether you are 100% import of fuel or producer of fuel. You are also affected differently. You saw the prices uh, of the petroleum coming down, and meaning that if you are a producer of those commodities, you are affected. But at the same time, if you are also producing minerals and other commodities, the prices have come down completely, and in this case, also Rwanda was among the countries that were affected. So it depends on a country by country, and also the structure of your economy. But it's not really for the sub-Saharan Africa. This has affected uh, different countries in different ways, depending on the structure of their economies. So we'll take uh, the last question. With uh, the... Maybe you can allow these two people to okay. ask their opinion. Last two. Their Thank answer. you, sir. Yeah. Just two in the front. <laughs> Um, I just want a little bit of clarification on the central bank you talk about. Uh, uh, are they the central banks in various member states or like a continental central bank you're talking about? And also uh, the change of source of funds from the revenue channels and the automatic disbursement you talk about, will there be difficulties in implementing 
uh, in, uh, in reality. And also I have this particular question, I want uh, some of your comments, which is concerning the, uh, the currency devaluation in, some, um, in many Afri African countries uh, due to the external shocks from the US interest rate um, hike. And how can Africa can cope with these kind of external shocks? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a good question. First of all, <clears throat> I don't see any difficulties on uh, the correction of the 0.2 percent of illegal imports. We don't see because that's what we correct. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> that's what we correct regularly. Then number two, opening an escrow account and giving instruction for the central bank to automatically disperse according to the assessed contributions. I don't see any problem with that. Now, thirdly, concerning the shocks that have been happening, and, and I need maybe to reflect back. After the financial crisis in 2008-2009, all the countries globally were affected. The liquidity declined. And that's why the U.S. Central Bank actually started the process of quantitative easing. Every month, it was dispersing about $80 billion to the market, purchasing the bonds of many countries that hold those kind of bonds from the U.S. But this one here ended in October 2014. When it ended, this injection of the money in the system declined. It by then had dispersed $3.3 trillion U.S. dollars. And once it purchases, it injects money and this money has to be used somehow. This is the money that was being invested in emerging markets everywhere. And that's why even for us in Rwanda, in 2013, when we went to the market with a euro bond, it was oversubscribed eight and a half times. And we got a very good price for that because that money was there. But then when it stopped, the other initiatives on quantitative easing that was tried was the European Central Bank, was the Bank of England, of course, together with Japan Central Bank. But this money was not anywhere near what the U.S. was injecting in the system. And that means there was less money for investment, meaning that from that time, the cost of making sure that you can borrow on international market went up, and it was costing almost everyone. And this was exacerbated by the fact that last year when the employment numbers and the economy of the U.S. was doing very well, they thought it was necessary to stop, not only uh, stop using the mechanism of quantitative easing, but they used the traditional central bank way of raising the interest rate because this time they were comfortable, because the economy had grown to a, a level that they were comfortable with. This had the impact of really affecting uh, once you raise the interest rate, meaning that actually people can get a bit more money because it's more attractive. And by doing that, then all the private money goes to the United States, meaning that actually for us, there is less money left for us in our own capital market and it is very, very expensive. That means the United States dollar becomes very, uh, uh, I would say, very attractive and that creates a depreciation. So you have the high cost of borrowing in addition to depreciation, and we are all affected in different ways. Whether you are in Europe and using the euro, whether you are in Rwanda and you are using the Rwandan franc, you are all affected, and that's why last year in the case of Rwanda, we had a depreciation of 7.5%. Now, what we are trying to do in these circumstances is to make sure that actually, because this was combined not only that effect, but also the slowdown in the, uh, I would say, readjustment in, the, in China, where the economy, which used to be close to 10%, it came down to 69 then 6.5% last year, and now it's expected to come down to about 6.3%. So that way then, they are the biggest consumer of most of our commodities, and once the economy declines, then also we are affected in terms of how much they import from us. And that's why we are taking other measures domestic reforms. In our case saying, how do we develop the export market here in Rwanda in a more dedicated manner? That's why we have established the whole industrial parks, the special economic zone, providing special incentives for exports 
to make sure that we can grow that sector. And also making sure that we put in place a mechanism, I would say the conducive environment. Now that we have macroeconomic stability, we needed to put, uh, we have the peace, security, we have good governance, we have the macroeconomic stability that are judged by almost any rating agency. At the same time, we need to, con to, to make sure that we put in place a conducive environment for investment, for business, to locate here, for tourism, and for other activities. These activities, they bring in foreign money. They bring in foreign currency. And together with exports, then it means that we can also cover our balance of payments with no issues. And that's why we are taking measures. Each country is different. Uh, the structure of the economy are different. But we are taking different measures to make sure that we can get out of any shock that comes our way. And I think as open economies, these shocks will continue. But we must have the capacity to make sure that we can respond to any shocks that come our way. Rakoze minister nitwa Rubi Olivier nandikira imvaho nshimwa no mu Rwanda. Eh minister twa tubabaze eh iyo mufashe imyanzuro nka gutya eh hakoresha uhe byo kujya muri kwashyizwe mu bikorwa. Ese yitaje tashyizwe mu bikorwa. Twajya mutubwire igihugu kitashyize mu bikorwa imyanzuro mu mwafashano gicibwa amande nka nagutese arangana bitewe n'ubushozi bw'igihugu ko bugiye butandukanye murakoze minister. Because, um, sorry, I have to speak in Kinyarwanda, and I hope all of you now understand Kinyarwanda from the, the week you have been here. Najirango, Shimiri, Goko, Anga, Ejo, Abakuru, Hugu, Bafashe, Umanzro, Uburyo, Bafasha, Umuryango, Achu, Umuryango, Umwe, Africa, Uburyo, Ushora, Kuwa, Kuifasha, Mugu, Chemura, Ibazo, Kwaidu, Fitevi, Janina, Finansoma, Yibi, Korwa, the African Union, the programs, Zizabo, uh, chane chane uh, ni wazo vijanye ni nambara ziri, ziri mu uh, mura Afrika anga ba fashu mnanzuro yuko wundi uh, uh, uburyo bwa zisangu kukoreshwa ahu yugu vya tanga mafranga vwe kuri bije paka java ya tanga huku nhu bitega nijwe hakenishi bja kunze kujiringorani uburyo bwa chizgue ho kwa kujirangu munu arewe uh, zero ni wiche bibiri kuija napja mafranga Ivi nubijo sebi njira mujuhugu. Ahanga haa jirafasha. Kujirango bjorohe mwurijo ya mafranga waneka. Haima mafranga nayo ako herezuwa mwurijo. Buta nyuze wenda mwurijo busanzu. Kwa mwuri biji ahugo ukanyura uliza Central Bank. Ahanga haa biroro hereza ababi kwara. Hariku nabijo vila hii chizere uri ya mwurijango kujira mshuwe kuwa kuzi nshinga na zao. Mwuma kushize awakuru yugu wafashi mnyanzuro ya ho. Bija ya ho igomba kujirango uh, dushore kwa yashi ikirwa ijana kwijana programs 25 kwijana nibikorwa bijyanye na mahoro nabyo bishobora kuba byashi ikirwa nibura 25 kwijana ahanga ha rero ibingibi uh, uyu mwanzuro wafashwe umwaka ushize ubu rero iki cyaje ari nk'igisubizo cyo kugira ngo bishyirwe mu bikorwa nao ahanga kandi mategeko asanzwe yuri ya muryango umwe bwa Afrika ateganye ibihano ntabwo ibyo bihano byavuyeho ibyo bihano rero bizajya bikoreshwa igihe hagize ikibazo cyari cyo cyose gishobora kuba cyabaho anga niyo mpamvu namwe bwanyungira mu mwaka wa amategeko agenga uwo muryango harimo of course nibyo bihano mwaka wa mubizi koko no muryango wacu nibyo bihano birateganijwe kandi ibyo bihano nabyo biri ni bihano bibonwa na buri muntu wese so ngira ngo byo byo ntago bizabaho byo bizakomeza so anga nta kindi kizahinduka ariko none twabonye uburyo bwiza dutekereza yuko nibyo bihano bitakabaye ngombwa koko uburyo bwashyizweho buzajya bufasha kugira ngo amafaranga bagereho hatabaye amananiza tukabona yuko bizahindura byinshi cyane Murakoze nyakomisa thank you sir uh, this brings the end to this uh, press briefing by minister Gatete we have an announcement from the African Union Commission the next press conference by uh, his excellency dr Riak Maliki minister of foreign affairs of Palestine has been postponed to 12 thank you